Um, so our next speaker is Brittany Veers. So Brittany um, is the Quail Forever and, and Natural Resource uh, uh, Conservation Service uh, Tennessee State Coordinator, and she's also a Southeastern Grasslands Initiative Liaison. Um, and she'll be discussing some remnant grassland uh, restoration um, uh, projects on private lands. Um, so Brittany uh, is originally from Northeast Texas in the uh, Black Belt region, uh, but grew up in Southern Indiana for the most part. She went to college at Murray State for undergrad and uh, her master's and has a passion for remnant uh, grasslands, glades, barrens. So uh, she's in, in good company here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, and, and we're excited to have her tell us about some of the private land restoration projects that, that she has been working on. So, Brittany. Thanks, Tara. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here really quick. Yeah, just thank you for that great introduction, Tara. Um, I'll start by explaining a little bit about um, private lands work. So it's pretty common um, uh, sort of with our upcoming or today's management strategies and partnerships that private lands positions are often like a hodgepodge. They're funded by multiple agencies and organizations and, and nonprofits. And um, it's just sort of like how it's been for probably the last 10 years. And uh, that's just going to continue as a trend. And that's because the federal agencies uh, really like partnerships because it's a honestly a cheaper way for them to achieve their goals. And also, um, you know, partnerships are just a, a great way to address conservation and everybody working together. So um, a big part of what I do is to sort of bridge the gap between um, sort of plant conservation folks and more um, natural areas folks with wildlife managers. Um, and, you know, as we all know, sometimes uh, those groups and that those dynamics um, are not always on the same page. And so our private lands team is, is trying to, um, um, be more cohesive and um, sort of um, establish, you know, friendships and working relationships with uh, those schools of thought. So um, I grew up on a row crop and cattle farm and, but I'm extremely passionate about grasslands and remnants. So um, it's, it, ends up working out a lot in our favor to sort of, um, you know, like for example, we'll work with cattle producers who are interested in planting native warm season grasses as a forage method to get over that summer slump, so to speak. So even though that's not necessarily remnant or restoration work, it's still better than something like Bermuda grass or Bahia in their um, um, farming operations, so. Okay, so just a brief background about Quail Forever and our Farm Bill partnerships. Um, this started back in, in 2003 with only four positions in South Dakota. We're now approaching probably 300 um, partner biologists nationwide within 24 states. So just wanted to give everybody a, a, a scope of um, how big our, our program has become. Um, so, over 91,000 projects on, on private lands. Um, and the funding sources are diverse. Um, the backbone of our partnership is USDA NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is the, the private lands branch of the USDA. Um, it, I would say nearly all of our positions have some NRCS involvement. And that's our model. Uh, our partner biologists are housed in NRCS county field offices so that they're in the know. They know what's going on with programmatic updates and changes, and they know how to implement them well. They're working hand in hand with uh, um, soil conservationists and district conservationists 
um, that are more, um, you know, soil health based and uh, more ag based, but it's, it's really handy to have an actual wildlife biologist sitting right next to um, the other planners. Um, we often have um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife involvement, um, National Fish and Wildlife funds. We have a, a private lands forester right now working on the Cumberland Plateau. And even though his title is forester, his mission is really to address forestry on the plateau really more as a restoration outlook. So he's working with landowners and making those recommendations and helping with farm bill programs uh, implementing them to basically remove a lot of um, hardwood encroachment, cedar encroachment, working on prescribed fire. So even though Forrester is his title because he's also reviewing um, private lands like forest management plans to make sure that they're um, up to speed and up to our standards, he's also really looking at his position and what he's doing from a you know, woodland and savanna and glade restoration uh, outlook. So, um, and then also very importantly, we have, so this confuses folks a little bit because there are Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever volunteer, um, just everyday citizen chapters. That's really the backbone of our nonprofit organization and a way to get private citizens um, involved in, in conservation and caring about quail and other grassland species. We have a chapter in Tennessee that are actually certified prescribed burn managers. And so they actually provide that as a resource for our landowners in West Tennessee. So, um, but these chapters, they hold fundraising events um, similar to like, I'm sure y'all are familiar with like Ducks Unlimited and National Wild Turkey Federation, but our model is a little, a little different because everything that's raised with that specific local chapter stays with that chapter. So they're able to do what they want with it. And like Chris was talking about Illinois, Illinois is a big uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever state. And a lot of those folks um, use their chapter money for habitat projects, grassland restoration projects. They also do a lot of burning or they may plant back something that's been lost from row crop production. So Anyway, our chapters are a really uh, important aspect to what we do. Okay, so I won't spend too much time on farm bill uh, information, but that this is what we're implementing for landowners. This is the funding that we are using to get our grasslands work completed. And it's definitely a focused approach. And you know, when people think about farm bill, it's more of a big picture like, folks think about ag practices and that's true but there's a ton of money that's designated specifically for wildlife every single year like equip the environmental quality incentives program for example 10 percent of that like 10 million dollars has to go specifically to wildlife every single fiscal year and that continues to get renewed um and it's not that it goes away if you don't use it but there's oftentimes a lot of states that don't come anywhere close to obligating what they've been granted um, from NRCS National. So uh, we're currently operating under the 2018 Farm Bill, which is a whole lot better. Um, the 2014 Farm Bill kind of got stripped from a wildlife standpoint. So we're really glad that we've got um, better funding for some of our Farm Bill programs, notably the Conservation Reserve Program, which is our 10 year program, sometimes 15 years in certain cases. Uh, but we really love this one because at least something is putting is being put back in habitat for um, at least 10 years and sometimes 15. And you can plant trees in, there is a tree planting option in this program, but most of what we're doing are things like CP42 pollinator habitat, um, field borders for bobwhite quail, we also ha have a new practice called prairie strips um, where some folks might have used a, uh, like a fescue cool season grass waterway. Now they can, they can actually do a wide like 50 foot strip of, of prairie plants. And, um, you know, depending on the state and like how technically sound and educated your private land staff is, sometimes folks will just sort of 
you know, use like a blanket pollinator mix, but um, I'm proud to say that I hold our staff at a, at a really a higher level. And I do a lot of training with native plants with them as they are hired so that they understand if they're creating a native seed mix and it's being planted into a, a row crop scenario or an old pasture scenario that they're putting the right species back um, with what historically occurred there. So that's really important to us to have that um, native plant integrity. So we also implement uh, what's called the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. This one is popular and highly desirable with a lot of landowners because it's, it's a quick contract. It's usually only two years and it's pretty simple. They do their practices or tasks such as targeting invasive species, um, you know, like I said, planting a pollinator mix or doing a thinning in a degraded woodland or savanna, targeting certain hardwoods with either hack and squirt or selective thinning, and then they get their payment. So it works really well. It's based on 75% cost share. Oftentimes it's more than that because we do work off of flat rate payment schedule. Um, so this is just, it's really beneficial. As long as the landowners have the funding up front, they will get their flat rate payment reimbursement after those uh, conservation practices are completed. We also have CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program. This one is uh, more complicated and sometimes hard for landowners to understand. And so it's more cumbersome from that standpoint, but it is desirable to some folks because it's a five-year contract and they get annual payments during that five-year time span, just like with CRP, they get an annual payment for 10 years. So um, CSP, like the whole rationale is to reward landowners for already being good stewards. So let's say somebody's already started tackling bush honeysuckle or uh, microstegium. They're already starting that process and, and, and then maybe they, the landowner gets to the point where he or she's like, well, I'm running out of funds. I'm, I'm doing all this work on my own, but I'm, I've got to the point where I need a little help. And so that's great. CSP would be a great option for them. Um, okay, now the one that I'm mainly gonna talk about, this is our Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And I encourage any of you that are doing private lands work, you could easily put a proposal together with partners and apply for RCPP. And if, especially if you are looking at a broad scope of grassland conservation or plant, whatever your focus is, your chances of getting approved with a more of an eco-region approach is much better than small, like a couple of counties or something like that. So like, you know, Chris was talking about all of Southern Illinois. I mean, that would be a great example, you know, maybe targeting glades um, of Southern Illinois, something like that, you know, and there may already be an RCPP there, I'm not sure, but just using that as an example. And so that's the reason why ours got funded. We have a four and a half million dollar RCPP for uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, and I'll um, get more into detail about that, but this just shows some examples of some successful RCPPs. Ours, for example, think of it as like an umbrella. So our RCPP has other Farm Bill program um, specific funding underneath it. So underneath ours, we have EQIP, CSP, and WRE. Now, uh, RCPP now is a standalone uh, program, which is a lot less cumbersome and more, it's, it's easier to work with. Um, but we're, ours was approved under the 2014 Farm Bill. So that's the reason why ours is more like that umbrella approach. So we spend a lot of time marketing, like pushing our programs. We do a lot of outreach. We do field days. We have landowner meetings where we uh, scrounge up the money and ask for donations for supper so that people will have a good hot meal while they're listening to us talk about grasslands. Um, we've had a lot of success with those. So it's very much like a boots on the ground grassroots approach. And as you can see the picture on the left, I'm 
speaking in the middle of a corn, corn and or a soybean and, and cotton field in, in Milan, Tennessee, which is heavy row crop country, but it also happens to be a grassland remnant county. So, uh, and so to explain what we're doing when that process gets started, um, after someone applies or they come to us and say, I need assistance, then we start planning. You know, we're going out to the sites, determining what's there. We also look at the surrounding landscape to see what native plants are still hanging on. And if we have to do a planting, we use that to help us as a guide to know what to put in our seed mixes. Now, in a perfect world, I would love for us to just utilize that native seed bank. But we all know, especially in Western Kentucky and West Tennessee, which is where I spend a ton of time, it's you, you have to rely on that historical information to basically recreate that prairie. Um, now, we do push those tree thinning and, and fire practices heavily. I, I'm hoping that we can see more of a transition to utilizing those in still intact seed banks as opposed to doing so many plantings. I'm trying to get our bios to really push those practices because what we have found is that thinning and burning is still, even though those are sometimes difficult tasks, more of the low hanging fruit because we still have some seed bank left where if we could get more sunlight and fire through those communities, we see that natural response. So like I said, we um, assist with a lot of prescribed fire. Um, we work jointly with our private lands uh, biologist partners in Tennessee, um, our TWRA PLBs, they often will be the serve as the burn boss and then we assist. So, okay, now switching gears a little bit and tying in SGI to what we're doing. Uh, we work day to day with the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Our executive director, Dwayne Estes, I'm sure a lot of y'all know Dwayne, um, Thea Witzel from Arkansas, Dr. Alan Weekly um, from North Carolina Botanic Garden. So we're using these maps um, to help us determine where we're focusing. And as you can see, um, even though SGI we're new and continuing to build our partnerships and our footprint. Everyone has to start somewhere. So we have a stronger presence in Kentucky and Tennessee and Alabama right now. But as we expand our partnerships, we actually have a coordinating biologist based out of um, UGA in Athens in, in Georgia now. So, you know, some folks get a little confused when we talk about our 23 state um you know, focal region. And no, we're not there yet, but we are going to get there with the help of our conservation partner. So, and this is what we're relying on. Oh, sorry. Um, gosh, we wouldn't be anywhere without Dwayne and, and Theo. They have done so much work and spent so much time looking at these old historical maps and looking at these clues and then helping us make those grassland maps. Cooper Breeden, my, my co SGI colleague with the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance, a uh, big shout out to Cooper because he's wonderful too. Um, he has made some of these maps and it, it's just vital. Like we could not do our, basically our recreation work without these clues. And as uh, so many of y'all can relate, a lot of times, especially when you're stepping into these encroached glades, encroached woodlands and savannas, uh, even a regular wildlife biologist, a standard wildlife biologist may not have any idea without knowing those plant clues that that historically was much more open. So this is really key information. Here are the grasslands that we consider that we um, focus on. I mean, as you can see, prairie savannas, you know, those mountain balds and um, Eastern Kentucky and East Tennessee. Um, that's our scope and our focus. Um, <clears throat> so here are the things, here are some species that we're primarily targeting. Okay, now tying the SGI work into our specific RCPP. 
Um, SGI is one of the main funders and really like the backbone of this RCPP. You know, like I said, that's where we're getting most of our information from. Um, they have also housed us, provided us office space, um, just great partners. Um, but the American Bird Conservancy, which is tied with the Central Hardwoods Joint Venture, that's the um, basically the, the grant holder. They are housing the funding. And then we are the subcontractors, which isn't important. All that matters is that we're getting the work done. But um, just to give you perspective on how many, we've got 11 partners on this RCPP. Now, that does make reporting a little challenging, but um, do whatever you can to get your RCPP approved. That would be my message. Okay, so the whole rationale behind our Grasslands RCPP because it's American Bird Conservancy grant, our, our three grassland focal birds, Northern Bob Whites, Hinslow Sparrows, and Eastern Meadowlarks. Um, and as we all know, Bob Whites and Meadowlarks used to be common as dirt. And, you know, I was doing grassland or um, bird surveys in college, you know, 15, 18 years ago. And even back then, Meadowlarks were so common. And I, it's just sad to see how much they've declined in that relatively short time span. Um, Hainsley sparrows are a little challenging for us to uh, really help on private lands just because they need such a large home range. Um, but again, we're doing the best we can for all of them. So when we're meeting with landowners, we're explaining to them that, um, you know, if grasslands restoration is suitable for your property and we know that it was a remnant, we really try to push our specific funding option with RCPP and explain to them that the birds are really, um, the birds and the rare plants are what we're trying to save. And um, we've had really good luck and success with the landowners that we've worked with. And it's been, um, kind of refreshing in a way because we've still been working with our traditional more um, ag background and uh, maybe um, game species focused type landowners but then we've also had a lot of landowners that really have cared more about um, biodiversity so that's been really cool um, so we relied on those maps like I mentioned earlier, to decide where our focal counties were going to be. Areas that still contain significant remnants and where we knew remnants occurred. And then also areas where we felt like landowner cooperation and interest were strong. Um, and then here, this just gives you a perspective on how much our funding is, or like how much we've got. Um, this is kind of nuts, but uh, NRCS somehow uh, missed how much CSP funding we had in the beginning. And so we ended up getting over $300,000 of CSP for, per state. And we didn't know that until after a year into the RCPP. It wasn't really anybody's fault. It's just sometimes things get lost in the shuffle. Um, but that was great news. And in Tennessee, we've obligated 90% of that CSP is a little harder push in Kentucky. Um, it's not as favored of a, a program just because like I said, it's, it's cumbersome and a little bit harder to implement with the NRCS folks. So it's just a cultural thing. Some programs are just stronger in some states than others. Um, but we've obligated most of our EQIP funding um, for each state. So here is our uh, grassland map for Tennessee. So this determined a lot of our, um, you know, focal county selection. Here are some grassland remnants. Um, like Chris had mentioned about just knocking on doors and like approaching random landowners, we do a lot of that. And it's, I would say the majority of the time, thankfully, they are at least willing to hear what we have to say and to be cooperative. Um, or at least like delay their mowing. Um, you know, mowing is an issue that we all address and face everywhere and um, definitely um, a big obstacle we face. But if we could just talk them into just waiting, you know, until those seeds are fully matured to do any cutting, um, a lot of times folks are willing to wait. 
So there's some cone flowers in Rutherford County. Um, the Van Buren County is on the plateau. There's a wet seepage glade there. Okay, so you know you might remember the the, the grassland map I just showed. So now this gives you perspective of why we chose the focal counties we did. And this is for EQIP and CSP. And then in Tennessee, we also had $2 million allotted for WRE, our wetland reserve easement program. Uh, this is a, this one was pretty tough um, because we're almost trying to find needles in a haystack, so to speak. We're trying to look for wet prairies and convince landowners to enroll in either a 30 year or a permanent easement. Now we have a lot of WRE interest overall in both states, but most of the time folks just wanna plant trees and be done with it. They don't wanna manage it like the wet prairie that it truly is. So of the 2 million, we have obligated 400,000 of that. And um, honestly, we're just happy that we got three easements out of it. And those are in White County, Henry County and Bedford. So two in Middle Tennessee and one in West. Okay, so here's our Kentucky, um, Tara, I'm sure you've seen this map. Um, our um, grassland map here and the yellow polygons are our quail focus areas or quail focal areas for that Kentucky Fish and Wildlife designates. And so we, in Kentucky, we also use that to determine um, where we wanted to put our focal counties. Now, Kentucky has a whole lot more focal counties than Tennessee, which is good and bad. It's good because uh, you have a lot of area to um, obligate your funding, but it's less of a focused approach. Um, so, um, you know, that's been, for the most part, advantageous. We've had some really good contracts in uh in the Jackson Purchase region. We've had a lot over in the those eastern counties. We have a really great farm bill liaison over there, Randall Alcorn, who helps implement RCPP. We love Randall. So um, anyway, so, and then just to give you a little more perspective, we call these um, practice codes. These are our conservation practice codes, which, you know, doesn't really mean much to the landowner. It's more for us to be able to designate what we're implementing. Um, but as you can see, you know, we've got brush management on there, early successional habitat um, for our livestock folks. Now they have to apply for native warm season grass pasture plantings um, in order to be eligible for the secondary livestock practices such as fence, waterers, and pipeline. Um, but as you can see, we've got prescribed burning in there, prescribed grazing, uh, riparian forest buffers, um, tree and shrub establishment. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time recreating uh, what were natural hedgerows for bobwhites. Um, they have to have escape cover or they will not make it. So we, we try to push native shrubs where they naturally occurred um, a lot. So. Okay, so our uh, summary of what we've, this is a little bit behind, but it just shows you, um, we've got about 250,000 remaining for EQIP in both states. And um, this gives you some acreage perspectives too. Um, uh, most of our contracts are 10 acres or less, but we do have some really, um, big like substantial 50 to 100 acre blocks which is you know really what we like to see um, but anyway this gives you some perspective on how many acres we've been able to um, implement of these programs on private lands so any questions thank you Brittany that was awesome um, we do have a couple questions for you. One from Wes Cunningham. He asked, what was the name, uh, for example, CP42 of the pollinator habitat replacement for the cool season vegetated swales? 
Okay, yeah. So that one is um it's it's actually CP43. It's called Prairie Strips. I hope that answers your question. Um it's that's the brand new uh practice under CRP that I mentioned. Um we've we've got a couple of those in West Tennessee. I'm not sure if they've used any of those in Western Kentucky yet or or Kentucky. Um but you know, again, I love those because especially if the landowner is, is um, comfortable with you going above and beyond the minimum like nine species seed mix, we often do like a 15 to 20 species seed mix. And we, of course, try to balance costs so that they're not, you know, breaking their the bank, so to speak, with their out of pocket expenses, even though they're getting reimbursed. We really try to, to push and strive for um a lot of forbs and native grasses that are site specific and and really try to address that from more of like a, a diverse standpoint and then our second question was from wiley paxton who is in charge of the fire effects monitoring for prescribed fire initiatives at the big south fork he oh, asked, cool. uh, do you have a counterpart that works with the national park service in kentucky for native grassland restoration? Hmm. Um, so not specifically that's just like primarily focusing on, on burning necessarily, but I should have said that under this RCPP, I've been the coordinator and then there are two uh, grasslands farm bill biologists underneath me. So I have one for Tennessee, and then we just replaced uh, the lady that we had before. Um, so Cody Jarrett will be starting January 3rd, and he is working out of um, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife WMA. I uh, can't remember which one, but I know he's going to be in central Kentucky, and he is basically going to be pushing the same stuff that we are, if that helps at all. And then we also have... Um, Zach Eirich, who's a coordinating biologist over in Chattanooga, but most of our SGI um, partner positions are more eco-region based, which is why I work in Kentucky and Tennessee both. So Zach also covers the plateau in the Ridgen Valley and parts of Appalachia. So Zach might be someone that might be helpful if you don't know him. And I'd be glad to like share anybody's information like points of contact and stuff with y'all. Mm -hmm. 